fat. I am so glad I am fulfilling the word of the Lord this morning. You shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Father, we thank you today that we are preparing for your arrival. And Father, today as we hear your word, may our hearts be open to what you are speaking to us. May we leave here more surrendered than we've ever been. May we leave here ready to receive you more than we've ever received you before because, Holy Spirit, we want all that you have for us. We want you to have your will and your way in our life. So today, we just give you room. We thank you for this time together. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people together said, Amen. Turn around, look at your neighbor and say, Prepare the room and you may be seated. I've told you this before, but my, my mom loved hosting people. And not only did she like hosting people, she liked having people into our home. Um, there was a famous story of an evangelist that stayed in our home one time. The, I told you that this house I grew up in was a very small parsonage. Um, and then we moved it to a bigger house after I left home. And so, But the parsonage we grew up in, we had an evangelist one time, and um, he was known to wake up in the middle of the night and pray. And, but he wasn't one of these quiet prayers. My mom said he would scream like a panther while he was praying in the middle of the night. So after doing that and them jumping up thinking somebody was breaking in, they sent him to the hotel the next time he came to visit and um, came to our church. But my mom loved when we, when we got a bigger house. She loved having an extra room to be able to invite people. And, they, and, they, and she would say, you can stay in the guest room or you can stay. They called it Justin's room. The truth is I never lived there, but that was what they called it. So you can come stay. But my mom always had a saying with people. She'd always tell them this. She'd say, let me know if you're coming by so I can prepare your room. I always thought that was kind of goofy. Prepare your room. Well, mom, that's not their room. But she wanted them to feel at home and comfortable. So she would say, let me know so I can prepare your room. What that meant was I'm going to make sure the sheets are washed and they're ready. I want to put you a bottle of water in there, make sure you got everything you need. I'm going to make sure the room's cleaned up and I'm going to make sure the, the, the guest bathroom and my mom was always, the house always looked good anyway, but you know, you just want to put those little touches on there. I'm going to make sure everything is ready. I want to prepare the room. I make jokes about Christmas and about Thanksgiving and all that stuff, but the truth is I love Christmas music. I, part of the reason I love it is because I love the theology that comes out in many of the songs, the things we say about Jesus. I love them, the way we describe him. Sarah and I and Benjamin were sitting at lunch this week here in town eating, and music's playing, and most of the time, you know, I don't think about the music in the background, but I know that it's usually secular music, country music, or some kind of maybe old, you know, I say classic rock. I'm getting old with the stuff I grew up in is now called classic rock. It's kind of embarrassing when you get to be that age. But, they, but the, the music's usually secular music, and we're listening, and they're playing Christmas music, and it dawned on me. I told Sarah, I said, much as I make fun of Christmas music, do you realize the witness that is going forth right now? Because here in a place where they normally, they're not anti-Christian, but they don't talk about Jesus everywhere, and you're hearing through the speakers, oh, little town of Bethlehem. You're hearing, talking about God, God in the highest, and all these things, and I'm thinking, wow, what a witness that is going forth. People are hearing about Jesus sitting, eating. So I love Christmas music for that reason. And one of my favorite songs is what we sang this morning, Joy to the World, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. But then, this is my favorite line, let every heart prepare him room. Let every heart make room for him. Let every heart prepare the way for Jesus to come. And here's the thing this morning, that one of the most important people in the Old Testament, I mean in, in, the, in the Bible, when it came to Jesus coming to this earth, in an advent, he is one of the chief figures, is John the Baptist. Now I understand, stick with me this morning, I'm going to get to some good stuff, but stick with me. I understand where he gets his name from. Here's John, he baptizes people, but I'll be honest with you, I think he's more John the Pentecostal. 
and he received the Holy Spirit. And he, and he told people, he preached kind of hard at people sometimes. And so sometimes secretly I'll just refer to him as John the Pentecostal. I'm just kidding, that was a joke. But here's John the Baptist, who is one of the chief examples uh, in, in, in Advent for this reason. Because John was the link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you read the Jewish, listen, to learn something this morning. I learned this this week. If you study the Jewish Bible and, and, the, and what they call the canon of Scripture in the Jewish Bible, the end of the Jewish Bible, the last book of the Bible, is actually Second Chronicles. That is the end of the Jewish Bible. But whenever they begin to make our Bible that we follow, the, the people that made that and put the canon together, as we call it, they put Malachi as the last book of the Old Testament because of what Malachi just told us. Malachi prophesied something, and then all of a sudden we turn over to the New Testament and it begins to happen. Malachi tells us there is one coming, and he is going to prepare the way of the Lord. There is one coming, and he is going to prepare the way of Messiah. And then in Luke chapter 1, listen to what happens. Are you with me this morning? Say amen. Luke chapter 1, verse 13. This is the angel speaking to Zacharias, John's father. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in spirit and in the power of who? What? You don't have a, oh, you don't have the scripture up there. I'm sorry. I thought that was up there. I was reading the whole time thinking y'all reading with me. And the power of Elijah. Everybody say Elijah. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Here all of a sudden is John the Baptist, and he comes on the scene, and he looks kind of weird. I mean, he is wearing some weird clothes, and he's got this long beard, and he's got honey in his beard, and he's eating locusts and wild honey, and he's preaching something, but he's doing something more importantly than that. He is preparing the way of the Lord. And Malachi says that Elijah the prophet is coming, and he means that symbolically. Elijah had already been, but there is one coming like Elijah, and when he comes, he is going to turn the hearts of the children to their father and the father to the children. And all of a sudden, John the Baptist shows up. And Luke says he shows up in the spirit of Elijah. And he begins to proclaim something. He begins to say, prepare the way of the Lord. Make room for him. I want you to know this morning, Jesus wants to visit you. He wants to live. Not just the Bible says that his house is not a human house made with human hands. In other words, his house is not something that we can build in longer. He doesn't live there. But the Bible says heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. But I want you to know this morning, besides that, Jesus also lives on the inside of us. But you know what? He wants to make we, He wants to make his way into our hearts, but we have to make room for him. Amen? Here's the thing. Jesus doesn't want weekend visits. He wants to dwell in you. He doesn't want to show up on Sundays when you come to church for an hour and live inside of you and just visit. He wants to dwell in you 24-7, but you've got to make room for him. You've got to make space for him. You've got to take your heart, and you've got to make room for what he wants to do right now. And John the Baptist began to proclaim, and he began to say, guess what? Prepare the way of the Lord. Messiah's coming, and if you don't watch it, you will miss out, and many of them do. They missed it. They missed the opportunity. Jesus says at one point that the prophets would have begged to see the day that you're seeing today because they believed it and they prophesied it, but you were experiencing it. And listen, right now it's easy to look around and to see all the terrible things happening around us, to see death and sickness. I'll be honest with you, I've struggled with this message for this reason today because my prayer the last couple of days was, Lord, I just want to offer hope this week because I have felt the weight of going places and hearing people talk about how the, the last couple of years have made them feel and things they're going through right now. And those of you that work in the public, people walk through and they talk to you about things and you feel the weight of what is going on. And it's easy for
for us to look around and say, Lord, it's difficult. This is not an easy time of the year. For some people, it's the most wonderful time of the year. For some people, it is a terrible time of the year. We miss loved ones. Things have happened, and it is very difficult. And it's easy to look on our society right now and to feel hopelessness and to feel despair and to feel down and to feel out. But here's the good news. Here's the hope we have. Number one, Isaiah tells us that guess what? That even in darkness, those that walk in darkness have seen a great light. The good news is this. I love the way that is said. It says just the word darkness. But when it describes the light, it doesn't just say light. It says those that walk in darkness have seen a great light. The light of God will always outshine the darkness of this world. The light of God will always outshine what is going on around us. And that is our hope today, that Jesus has come. Amen? Why did, why did Messiah come? Jesus. First John tells us, for this reason was the Son of Man manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Why was the Son of Man manifest? To destroy what the enemy wanted to do. The enemy wants to destroy our lives. The enemy wants to stop us. He wants to discourage us. He wants us down and depressed and feeling like life is not worth living. But Malachi promises us this, that you know what? Those that fear the Lord, we're going to see something happen. We have seen the Son of Righteousness rise with healing in his wings. The Son of Righteousness has come, and he came not to destroy. He came not to destroy us, but he came to destroy what the enemy wanted to do, but he came for one reason, the enemy wants to destroy, but Jesus came to restore. When I think of healing, he rises with healing in his wings. Because of my background, and as far as being Pentecostal, our mind automatically goes to physical healing, and I believe in that. I believe God heals. We believe in laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. I believe God can do it. He's done it in my life, and I've seen him do it before. But I want you to know today, it is not limited to physical healing. I believe today he came to heal our bodies, but he came to heal our souls. He came to heal our minds. He came to restore families. He came to restore situations. He came to restore everything the enemy has meant for evil. God is turning around for our good. He is a God of restoration. He is not a God that wants to destroy things. He wants to restore things. He wants to restore things to us, and we have to have hope today that, you know what, even though it feels like darkness is everywhere, we have seen a great light, and that light, John says, is the light of men. Jesus, the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. His light has been still shining. Amen? Here's the difference. You see, in Isaiah's day, they walked in darkness, and we still walk around with, with darkness. But the difference is, they walked in darkness and a light hadn't shown up. We walk around darkness, but the light has already come, and we don't have to live in the darkness. We don't have to live with the darkness overcoming. Instead, we can see the light, and we can see the light work in our life, and we can see God bring restoration, and what Jesus wants to do is to rise in our life with healing in his wings, and where the enemy wants fractured situations and fractured relationships, God says, I bring things together, and I will heal. I will do what I only I can do, and right now, we have to have hope. You say, well, pastor, you don't know how bad it is. I want you to know today, I know that I serve a God that is greater than anything we are facing, and that we serve a God who is still rising with healing in his wings, and he is still making room for restoration in our lives. Amen? He's a God that restores. He's a God that puts things back together the way they were meant to. So, all of a sudden, we realize Malachi promises he is rising with healing in his wings. But then it says this about John the Baptist. Let me say this first. Isaiah 11 is an image that I love. It's one of my favorite images about Jesus. And if you read it in the King James, the New King James, it's kind of confusing. It says a root of Jesse, and that doesn't really... But if you read it in, in some of the other translations, it says 
Isaiah 11 says is, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch uh, and, 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 and from his roots shall bear fruit. In other words, what you look at is dead. God says, I've still got some life involved. And whenever I get done with it, it looks like a little shoot right now, but that little shoot is going to grow up, and he's going to grow up into Messiah, and he's going to bear much fruit. And what the enemy meant to destroy, God says, I am bringing back to life from that. And I just want to give you some good news this morning. Some of you feel like a stump. You feel like, you know what? Everything's dead. Nothing good's going on. Things are terrible right now. Things are not the way I want them to be. But if you'll look closely, there is still a stem of Jesse that can come out of that stump. And God says this morning, I will bring it back to life. I will begin to change things. And I can resurrect things. And I can bring things back to life. Amen? That's what, that's what Advent is all about. It is about us realizing that Christ has come to destroy what the enemy wanted to do and restore everything that was lost in the fall. Do you understand that? Because of the fall, we were separated from God. Sin separated us. But not just from God, from each other. Sin separated relationships. And Jesus came. And Paul says this, that he has broken down the middle wall, that he is our peace, who has broken down the middle wall of separation, that he came today to bring us back into relationship with the Father and with each other. He came to restore so I can walk in the fullness that God gave Adam. He came as the second Adam. The first Adam blew it. But Jesus came as the second Adam. And he did what the first Adam couldn't do. He fulfilled the law. He did everything he was called to do. He goes to the cross and the Son of Righteousness rises on the cross with healing in his wings. The stripes on his back were for the healing of the nations. And he comes and he gives his life and he gives his blood so that we could be set free so that now we are in right relationship with God. He came to restore it. Amen? And that's what John said. John said he will turn the hearts of the children to their fathers and the fathers to the children. Let me say this to you this morning carefully. We live in a fatherless society, generation, society. If I, if I could get into it today, and the reason I'm careful to say this is because I do not want to beat up dads. I look around the room and I see some great fathers that are, that are good fathers. So I'm not trying to beat up fathers this morning. But if you study, study our prison system. I've told you this many times before. Uh, but if, if you, when they do Mother's Day, they, 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 they do this one test. That's what they did Mother's Day. They sent out cards for Mother's Day. And the inmates could get all the cards they wanted for Mother's Day. Every single card that they put out, these men sent to their mothers. They put out the same amount of cards for Father's Day and only a couple cards for each other. Isn't that crazy? Because if you look at crime, if you look at a lot of things in our society that we look down upon, fatherlessness is something we can point to in that moment. Here's what I believe. I believe that many times what happens naturally also happens spiritually. The Bible says it this way in Corinthians. Paul said, first the natural, then the spiritual. And I believe they will mirror each other sometimes. And I believe this. I believe that fatherlessness is not just a symptom naturally, but I believe spiritually it's the same thing. I say this to you today with love, but we have, we in this, I don't, I'm not pointing at you, I mean the church in general. We have the most shallow Christians than we've probably had in the history of the world, if I'm being honest with you this morning. It's, we, we, have, we have shallow preaching, shallow Christians. We have people that do not have, they're not rooted and grounded, and all they care about is the next big sermon. You know what the pressure is on a pastor right now? The pressure is to have that one thing that people want to tweet about while you're preaching. To have that one line everybody wants to write down, boy, that was good stuff. i got to have that one stinger. i got to have that one line. And guess what? Preachers work all week long not to have a deep message, but to have a zinger that people want to tweet about them so that they can begin to build their brand and their name. And if we're not careful, what happens is this. Listen, there's a difference between a parent and a father. There's a difference between somebody that just shows up and somebody that cares about you. Here's the truth about my dad. I love my dad, but I knew my dad was serious about things. And there was going to be discipline involved if I messed up. He was going to teach me what I needed to teach me. You know what Paul said? He, he told, I believe it was the Corinthians, but Paul said this. He said, you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but you have not many fathers. You've got a lot of people that will teach you things, but you don't have fathers. You know what a father does? A father is honest with you even when you don't want to hear what he has to say. A father will discipline you even when you don't want to be disciplined. A father will lovingly show you and kindly show you the way you're supposed to go even when you don't want to hear those things. And here's the thing. I believe if we're not careful in the church, we have not had many fathers. We've not had people step up. And I believe that's actually genderless because I believe we need mothers as in the church as 
much as we need fathers. In other words, we need people that are spiritually mature that can show other people this is how you follow after God. This is what you do. Paul said it this way in Corinthians. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after God. You imitate me, and you, if, you, if you follow me, you're going to be following after God. And what John the Baptist came to do was to prepare people so that they could see the heart of the Father. Jesus came not only to die for our sins, but he came to show us what the Father looked like. Listen, the Old Testament sometimes seems like God is different than the New Testament. Let's be honest. The God of the Old Testament seems to have some rage and some, you know, just some anger. Boy, he's ready to smite people. And then Jesus shows up and he seems different. And it looks like, okay, is this two different gods? What is going on? And the reason that John the Baptist is important is because he is the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Matter of fact, some people call him the last Old Testament prophet. And John the Baptist is showing us something, that Jesus came not to show us a new God. He came to show us what God was always like. This is what God always meant from the beginning. This is what God always looked like, that Jesus came full of truth and justice. He came full of grace and truth. He came and he preached the truth and he told the Pharisees, you've messed up your whitewashed tombs. You look good on the inside, but on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. But he looks at a woman that had never understood grace and he told her, woman, where are thine accusers? She had just got caught in the act of adultery. And then he said, go and sin no more. In other words, woman, you are forgiven. I don't accuse you, but go ahead and live life and quit living the life of sin because I have something better for you. Jesus showed up and he showed us what God was always like. Jesus came to reveal the Father heart of God to us. Because here's the truth. If you had a dad that was very disciplinary, you may look at God and say, I'm scared to death of you because every time I mess up, I'm scared all you want to do is is beat me like my father. And you know what Jesus shows up and says? Yes, God has discipline involved. And yes, God has a truth. But you know what? He does it in a way that makes you want to, to love him even greater. He does it in a way that makes you want to be redeemed even greater. He does it in a way where you don't run from him, but you run to him. And he's the father with his arms open wide. This morning, I was trying to get ready. I'll be honest, I was trying had my sermon on my mind, and Benjamin was in there trying to play around. And I just was kind of thinking in my head, son, please, this is not the time. And you know what he did? He runs to me, and he grabs my leg, and he begins to hug my leg. I threw down whatever I was doing. He puts his mouth up. He wants to give me a kiss. You know what? I put down everything that I was doing because in that moment, moment, this boy's giving me some affection, and I am going to look at him, and I'm going to hug him, and I'm going to kiss him. I can shave in a minute. I can finish brushing my teeth and get ready in a minute. I am going to give him this attention because he is coming, and he's loving. I am so glad that he runs to me and not from me, and I want you to know this morning, John the Baptist came to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. He came to show you today we're not called to run from God. We're called to run, run to God into the arms of a loving father that loves you and cares about you. He's not angry at you today, but he wants to give you hope and life. He has risen with healing in his wings, and he's come to give you hope and life today, that life can be different. Amen? Well, the worship team, join me. I'm almost done. But here's the the key. Here's the key to all of this. And it's what I talked about at first. Prepare 
50 yards, and everybody's celebrating him, and the fullback's laying on his back. But if it was not for that fullback that knocked those guys out of the way, that running back would have never had room. And I want you to know today, God is telling you today, I believe the Holy Spirit works like the fullback in our life. I believe the Holy Spirit pushes things out of the way to prepare for you. But here's the thing, he's a gentleman, and he's not going to do it without your permission. So today, my question is this, are you making room for Jesus to come into your life the way he wants to show up? Are you letting him, he wants to show up with hope today. He wants to rise with healing in his wings. He wants to show up in a way you've never seen him before, but you've got to make room for him. You've got to do it. How do we do that? John the Baptist had one message, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We repent. We stop living life our way, and we turn towards God, and we begin to let God work in us. Repentance.